Welcome to my talk about worst case execution time analysis on modern processors. My name is Christian Humbert and I'm proud to present timing verification solutions of Absinthe. For those who haven't heard about Absinthe so far, Absinthe is a classical tool provider company and provides solutions for validation, verification and certification of safety critical systems. The company has been founded in February 1998 by six researchers of the Saarland University in Germany around the group of programming languages and compiler construction of Professor Dr. Dr. Reinhard Wilhelm. The company is still privately held and um, we are more than 40 uh, employees and uh, targeting the 50. Here is a list of selected customers from uh, which I'm allowed to show, and they are coming from the uh, sectors of the avionics, um, as you can see, the space, but also the automotive and uh, generally um, where safety critical applications are developed. Here's an overview about the absent key products. Let's start with the source code level analyzers, the Astre and Rule Checker. Astre detects all runtime errors like division by zero, array out of bound excesses, or uh, arith arithmetic um, overflows, but also data races and deadlock problems and many other critical errors. Rule Checker is a tool that checks coding guidelines like MISRA, CERT, or CWE. And then Absinthe offers also a compiler, and this is not a standard compiler, it is a formally verified but also optimizing C compiler that has been mathematically proven to be correct, and so you can avoid miscompilation problems. Then we enter the binary level with the product stack analyzer. This solution provides safe upper bounds on the maximal stack usage so that you can of individual tasks so that you can exclude stack overflow problems. You might have seen the product presentation and demo video of Stack Analyzer on our channel as well. In today's talk I'd like to focus on the timing verification solutions AIT and TimeWeaver. But before we dive into these two uh, tools, I'd like to provide a short motivation on why it is so important to determine the worst case execution timings in real-time systems. In these embedded real-time systems, the correctness of the system not only depends on their functional aspects, but also on their temporal aspects. And that is why these real-time tasks must terminate within reliable timing bounds, or uh, here specified timing constraints called deadlines. If these timing constraints are violated, this is a defect that may potentially cause an entire system failure, and of course also degrades the availability of the system. And that is why in all safety standards um, it is demanded that an upper bound or an upper estimation of the required resources for these embedded software shall be made, including the execution time. And we distinguish here two levels of timing, which I've shown on the, the next um, slide in more detail. We have on the one side the code level, where we focus on single processes, tasks, but also interrupt service routines. And here we have a look to the call and control flow of that processes and focus on the processor architectures with its pipelines and caches in order to, to, to determine or calculate the worst case execution time. And then on the next higher level, on the system level, where you have multiple functions or tasks running in one system, here people are focusing on how to integrate or finding a schedule of these individual um, tasks in order to compute an end-to-end -end timing or a worst case response time. And to calculate, to be able to calculate that worst case response time, the core execution times, like the worst case execution time, must be known. But how to determine 
these worst case execution timings for individual tasks on code level. Here I have a graph that shows on the x-axis the execution time of one task running on one trivial single core architecture. Let's stay for a moment with this scenario. And on the y-axis um, there is the probability with which such an execution time may occur. And as you can see, if you start now using traditional approaches, dynamic measurement based approaches, you will typically end up in an area where you have a high uh, observation probability to observe a certain execution time. We have learned in safety critical applications, it's demanded to provide or to find an upper bound on the needed resources like the timing. So uh, people would certainly be interested in that exact worst case execution time. But unfortunately, this is a theoretical value which nobody can compute in general. You might have heard about the halting problem, uh, which is kind of reduced uh, problem to this one here. The halting problem says there is no algorithm that can decide about another algorithm if it terminates or not. So in general, um, there is no um, solution available that can compute the exact worst case execution time for arbitrary general programs. But it should be possible to use abstraction and to determine a safe upper bound for this worst case execution time. In principle you can distinguish two different reasons why you have such an uh, execution time variance of one single task. The first one is that you might execute different code parts within the same task depending on the program's conditions that are dynamically computed. And on the other side you might have a time variability because of the underlying hardware. In order to explain that, have a look to that simple assignment here on the left side where we add um, two variables a and b and write back the result to a third variable x. This is usually translated by a compiler into a code sequence like this where we load the content from variable a into register r2 and the content of variable b to register r1 and then we sum up both contents and write the result back to machine register r3. Of course this small piece of code um, has a completely different execution time behavior when you uh, let it run on, on different hardware, on different CPUs, right? But even within the very same uh, CPU or hardware, um, you may have a timing variability um, because of the different memory areas, the different memory components you are accessing. So, for instance, assume if we load these two variables from some internal fast RAM, we may have immediately the values available uh, in the pipeline. But uh, what if we have to um, fetch it from, from some flash, where we have to open the, the, the flash um, window first, this may cause some wait cycles. Or if we have to uh, arbitrate the external memory, uh, this might even take much longer. So it's really important that in order to compute a safe but also precise worst case execution time for uh, some code sequence, it's important about uh, to know the execution history and especially to know about the cache contents and the pipeline behavior. Because even if you, if you go a step further to a more complex architecture here, in this case the PowerPC 755, you may might, ha might have um, much higher variability between the best and worst case um, uh, scenarios. So in other words, it's not feasible or not applicable to always assume the absolute worst case for every individual instruction because this would end up with a huge overestimation which is uh, not acceptable. So we have learned that in order to determine a safe but also precise worst case execution time of a task, exhaustive testing is not possible since nobody knows the input, the worst case input leading to worst case execution behavior. Basically one does not know when to stop the testing activities. 
but it should be possible to statically determine this timing guarantee and compute safe upper bounds on that worst case execution time. Hereby, the behavioral variance should be as low as possible, because the larger the behavioral variance is, the more the execution time will depend on the execution history. The less meaningful is a measurement in a given execution context, and the larger can be the gap between the largest observed and measured execution time and the true worst case execution time, which is basically defining the amount of overestimation. So for the remaining part of this talk, I'd like to introduce the concept of timing predictability of a processor. A processor has a high timing predictability if the behavioral variance is low and it has a lower timing predictability if the behavioral variance is higher. Of course, when you want to determine worst case timings, you have to take into account um, hardware, critical hardware effects as well, like timing anomalies or cache domino effects on the hardware. A timing anomaly, for instance, is when you have a local non-worst case decision like a cache hit that would lead on global level to a worse timing behavior than the local worst case decision like the cache miss. Or for the domino effects, um, this is also very contra, uh, very um, uh, contraintuitive that the empty cache is not necessarily the worst case initial cache state. So far we have talked about individual tasks running on single core architectures. But what happens if you migrate the application to a multi-core platform? This photo taken in 1931 um, at the time of the banking crisis impressively shows what will happen if you have a shared but limited resource like the bank and its money and in more technical aspects our memory and when people, a lot of people, would like to allocate that um, resource in parallel you know, like our memory requests. This might risk to have or to lead to contention and uh, blocking effects. So if you migrate your more distributed single core processing system architecture where you have several ECUs with their local memories connected through an interconnect bus to a more central multi-core processing uh, system architecture where you no longer have um, local memories um, and accesses one shared memory instead, we have a new challenge um, that has to be taken into account, namely the interferences and the blocking effects that may occur. And if you do it in a naive way, uh, the migration uh, study has shown that um, you may have, in this case here, three to four orders of magnitude more resource conflicts, conflicts than before, and you may even slow down the entire system more than you would gain by uh, the parallelization. This means it is absolutely mandatory to avoid contention on shared resources like memories or caches, since these accesses to the shared resources might be delayed. Experts like us um, propose that all interference channels have to be identified and also in the second step minimized. So that means you should really use sharing only if it's, if it's really needed. And luckily, static analysis solutions, like for instance a data flow analysis on C code level in Astre, can help to identify these interference channels. Or a static resource access counting in IT, for instance, can help to minimize them. The experts from the Certification Authority software team, CAST, they propose in their position paper about multi-core processes that either you have a robust time and resource partitioning or the worst case execution time has to be determined with all software components running on all cores and executing in the intended final configuration. Absint has solutions for both scenarios. I'd like to start with introducing the IT worst case execution time analyzer to you.
which is a um, verification tool that s computes safe upper bounds on the worst case execution time, so basically giving you timing guarantees. And IT supports complex processors, even with timing anomalies and domino effects, including multi-core processors that can be configured for timing predictability, like for instance this MPC uh, 5777M or the Aurix um, architecture. Here's a list of uh, some proposals to engage a smart hardware configuration, uh, especially to increase the timing predictability of a processor. The scope of IT is that we analyze single individual tasks or processes or interrupt service routines. That means we assume initially that there is no interference coming from the outside. So especially these effects of interrupts, preemptions or um, these interferences fl coming from direct memory accesses or these multi-core uh, access to shared resources are not reflected in the initial predicted worst case execution time computed by IT, but these effects can conservatively be approximated. For instance, by uh, using the IT support to compute cache-related preemption costs or to use this um, static resources, uh, resource count accesses to shared resources. And then these additional effects, these additional timings can be added during the system level, the scheduling analysis um, level um, in, on top of the worst case execution time. So you see here this formula would ref reflect the interference uh, part. Here's an overview about the inputs and outputs of IT. IT is a static program analyzer that has a model of the underlying microarchitecture with its caches and pipelines included um, and does not need any relation to the concrete hardware execution. So that means basically we would uh, need as first input the executable program of the application, typically in the ELF format. We recommend that this executable has been compiled with dwarf debug information in order to have still a relation to the original application code. But as you can see by this dotted line here, um, this is not taken, the application code, as primary input. The analysis is done on the final linked executable program. In addition to the executable, we also need a set of entry points which you would like to analyze. So basically the task entry points or the entry points for runnables or processes. And last but not least, we also need um, so-called user specifications. Um, the analyzer, for instance, tries to determine uh, upper bounds on loops um, in the analyzed task, but if you have more complex loops um, where the iteration count depends from some outside decision or from some complex computations, um, the analyzer might uh, request for uh, yeah, upper bounds for that loop iterations in terms of the user specification. This is just one example. Another example would be um, the recursions or computed calls. For instance, if you make usage of dynamically computed functions in your application, um, the analyzer tries to, de to resolve them statically, but um, whenever this is not possible because of abstraction, um, the user must specify the targets of these computed calls. Yeah, and then uh, the analyzer computes um, the worst case execution time upper bound and also visualizes that path or an example path leading to the computed worst case execution time bound. The IT is not just one analyzer, it's more a tool chain of individual analysis processes and uh, you can mainly divide these um, into three different stages. So we first have the decoding stage, then we have the static analysis stage and last the path analysis stage which determines the longest path execution. So when we start decoding the main challenge 
um, while decoding or reconstructing the call and control flow of a task is to resolve computed calls, uh, so dynamically dynamically called functions. And um, we have certain um, techniques to uh, statically resolve a lot of computed calls by yeah, using um, instruction patterns or recognizing instruction patterns, extracting um, constant function pointer targets out of arrays, or use so-called iterative decoding aspect, which uses the value analyzer um, that computes basically register and memory cell contents at every machine instruction. And whenever it comes to um, a computed call instruction and has collected some um, addresses um, for that computed call targets, it communicates that back and starts the, iter the, the decoding process all over again. Only the remaining um, not yet resolved computed calls must be annotated and specified by the user. Then, following the value analysis, uh, which is also responsible for computing effective addresses of memory accesses, uh, we also determine upper bounds for uh, loop iterations for every loop in the analyzed task. Um, this works for simple for or counter loops quite nice, um, more complex loops that depend on outside decisions or uh, more complex computations um, will also be requested to be bounded by, by the user. Then we have the microarchitecture analysis. Uh, we basically have an internal model, timing model of the underlying uh, hardware, of the underlying cache and pipeline architecture that will determine the worst case execution timing of each individual instruction. Um, that we have decoded, no? taking the value analysis information about the effective addresses into account. So that after this second phase, the second stage, we basically know um, the worst case timing um, that is caused by each individual instruction. So that in the last stage, last phase, um, we can search for that longest path um, where which would lead to the highest uh, timing, basically the worst case execution time. And we use, for that purpose, we use um, a, um, yeah, an optimization concept called integer linear programming. Uh, so we basically generate a constraint system um, that dictated by the structure of the analyzed task plus the timings um, coming from the cache and pipeline analysis. And this enables us to solve a maximization function uh, to find the longest path. Before we come to an IT product demo, I'd like to summarize the benefits of the AIT tool. The worst case execution time results for each uh, task or processes in your system can be determined fully automatically. So um, since it is a sound static program analyzer, which does not need any relation to concrete hardware execution, the results, the computed results are valid for all inputs in all execution scenarios. And in especially, you do not need to modify or instrument your code. Um, and since it is static, um, you can seamlessly integrate uh, the IT analysis into any existing development tool chain. Also, automatic tool qualification is available. So you can qualify the IT according to the highest safety uh, levels in the various safety standards like the ISO um, uh, up to ASIL D or the DO78 B and C up to level A. So the main application areas of IT are timing verification, but you can also gain feedback for optimization and enable a better software integration, especially also um, in, in the multi-core uh, architectures, as you can uh, count, for instance, also for uh, resource accesses. If you would like to proceed with the demo on IT now, you can click on that banner here. Alternatively, you can also um, wait for the end of this video, where I also, uh, or again, present um, the links to the demo video. While the computational power and CPU complexity on modern processes increases, the timing predictability of these architectures usually decreases. For example, let's have a look to the Freescale P4080 architecture. 
Here we have a high, highly parallel execution of eight E500 MC cores, which um, each of them come with a local disjoint level one cache, a local unified level two cache, and a shared level three cache um, shared among all the cores, uh, as well as a shared DDR, DDR RAM controller and shared interconnection networks with lots of network traffic related peripherals. So empirical measurements have indicated that the overhead pair memory access on this architecture can vary between a factor of 1.6 and 25 between isolated and concurrent execution, depending on the type of memory which is accessed. That means we have a huge variability of um, execution time here and so a reduced uh, timing predictability. Remember the proposal of the Certification Authority software team, um, which said that we either should have robust time and resource partitioning or observe and determine the worst case execution time uh, while the software is running, uh, while all software components are running on all cores um, in the intended final configuration. Well, you might be able to ensure a robust time and resource partitioning on the software architecture part, but no longer on the hardware in this case for the P4080. So you have to stick with the second um, part of that proposal. And for that, Absinthe introduced the hybrid worst case execution time analysis approach. The hybrid analysis worst case execution time analysis approach combines the traditional static analysis components and with real time tracing with hardware measurements. So we can compute a worst case execution time estimate based on the extracted execution timings from the real time traces and the uh, calculated static value and worst case path analysis results. An advantage is that with using this approach you can accumulate all the interferences that occur during this final intended execution and these interference effects, these blocking effects will then automatically be taken into account and are contained in the calculated worst case execution time bound. One caveat is the so-called probe effect. Um, the safety standards, for instance, um, say that it can be necessary to show that code instrumentation has no effect on the test results. But since code instrumentation in modern architect architectures always have an undesi undesired and un unintended um, effect on the results, you must make sure that you don't have these uh, probe effects and um, that you do not rely on code instrumentation. We have implemented our solution in a tool called TimeWeaver, which is a hybrid worst case execution time analyzer for these modern high-end CPUs and which combines this real-time tracing with the traditional static analysis approaches. Here's an overview about the inputs and outputs of TimeViva. It is very similar to what we've seen for the AIT case. Um, we need, in addition to the executable program, the uh, list of entry points and the user specifications, now also instruction level traces, which can be uh, recorded um, in advance uh, before doing the static analysis. And in especially, the user can produce several trace files and um, provide them all as input to the time beaver. So the output is also very similar, but um, extended. So first of all, we compute a worst case execution time estimate um, based on the local tracing information, but it is extended by also providing an overview about the trace coverage. So since we know the entire call and control flow graph, and we also know what has been executed over all traces, over all trace snippets that has been provided as input, we can map the information what has been executed during the measurements to what can be theoretically executed in the task. 
And this provides a nice uh, trace coverage uh, report and gives indications on how to improve the test settings um, to have a better coverage for um, the tracing. On top of that, we also provide a time variance report um, over all traces. Since we can have different execution timing for the individual instructions uh, depending on the different uh, test scenarios, we will show how uh, here the variance is. And of course, for the worst case consideration, always the maximum timings will be extracted for each instruction. Of course, also a visualization of the worst case path will be done, and we have an extensive documentation uh, package here as well. But how can these instruction level traces be produced in a non intrusive way? TimeViva relies on architectures, modern architectures with so called embedded trace units that allow to connect a debugger which can record the program flow traces. Of the, of the application that is currently running in parallel. Having these program flow traces and uh, corresponding timestamps, uh, we are able to map this information back to our reconstructed call and control flow graph. So TimeViewer supports basically the PowerPC architectures that provide this Nexus uh, program traces. Um, at least class two is required here in the trace data. Uh, and this can be generally can be generated by, for instance, these um, architectures here, the NXPP and T series, um, but also some older um, E200 um, derivatives. TimeViva also supports the ARM architecture with the core side embedded trace macrocell uh, instruction trace data that is generated, for instance, by the high-end uh, Cortex A53 but also some older Cortex-R5F. And last but not least, TimeViva also supports the Aurix, the Infineon TriCore Aurix platform uh, with the multi-core debug solution MCDS program traces. In case of the Infineon Aurix architecture, TimeViva can directly connect to an Infineon DAS trace server, which itself is connected to an uh, emulation device uh, board and so TimeViva can control the tracing activity directly and especially there's no need for an extra debugging solution in this case. In order to better understand the differences between the hybrid worst case execution time approach with TimeViewer and the pure static approach with AIT, I have put here the um, TimeViewer stage overview again. And it looks very similar to um, the stage overview of AIT. And especially, um, we share the very same uh, first phase of the decoding of the reconstructing of the call and control flow graph, right? Uh, we also have in TimeViewer the value analysis and an especially a loop bound analysis which will also statically determine worst case upper loop bounds and uh, later if we um, extract loop bound information from the traces as well we compare that to what we have analytically determined and may also scale the timing contribution of one loop iteration up to what we have um, determined as a worst case loop bound. That is what we call loop scaling. The next uh, uh, step here inside of the static analysis has been replaced. It's the micro architecture analysis that has been replaced by the so called trace analyzer, which reads in, uh, reads in all the trace information the user provides as input. So, especially all accumulated and collected uh, trace data over all test scenarios. So, that after this step, we have a worst case execution timing information for all instructions again, uh, this time based, of course, on the local. Um, trace information on the local maxima we have seen. And then in the last step, again, we are searching for the longest path through the entire um, graph, reconstructed uh, call and control flow, and of course restricted to that code parts which have been covered over all traces. Yeah. Um, and then at the end, we have, have found the worst case execution time uh, path and can produce a worst case execution time estimate. 
as an example for the visualization of the worst case path, and we will see that in the um, Time Viva demo as well. Um, it looks like this on the control flow graph. We have an indication on the worst case path in the control flow by some red halo edges and on the call graph by these red call uh, edges. But since we have a complete reconstruction of the call and control flow and we can map what has been executed over all traces to that graph, we can also indicate which parts of the code has not been have not been executed, so for instance by these red borders here. Uh, so this else branch in this example was not covered in over uh, all trace information. Or on call graph level even uh, the entire subtree or subgraph here uh, starting from math here uh, was not covered in any of the trace files. In addition to what I've presented about the loop upscaling where we uh, scale the contribution of uh, loop uh, body execution from the observed and executed uh, iterations to the analytically determined worst case iteration counts. We also um, provide a feature which is called worst case execution time path extrapolation. And I'd like to explain that on this simple example here. In this example, I have um, two consecutive if statements um, where we check two independent um, conditions. In this case, we check if the variable one is smaller or equal than 10, then we execute sum bar one. Or in the next case, we, ex we check if the variable two is smaller or equal 20, then we execute faculty of y2. Um, in our test, in our measurement scenarios, I have uh, executed this first execution trace where we do not enter the den in the first branch, but we enter it in the second and vice versa. But as you can see, um, we would have two additional execution traces which were not covered in our uh, measured data and our trace data. But TimeViewer, as it extracts the uh, local uh, worst case timings for the instructions, can recombine this information and extrapolate it to find um, statically an, uh, yeah, a severe, a more severe or longer execution path, uh, which is in this case here, uh, entering the, 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 the branches twice. This is what we call it, um, WCT extrapolation. Before we come to a product demo on TimeViewer, let me conclude what I've told you today. The violation of timing constraints in safety-critical real-time systems can be avoided using state-of-the-art timing verification technology of Absinthe. While the AAT Static Worst Case Execution Time Analyzer provides absolute guarantees on the worst case execution time behavior, for timing predictable single or multi-core architectures. The Time Beaver as an hybrid worst case execution time analyzer combines the traditional static analysis approaches with non-intrusive hardware measurements. So it is suitable for many modern high-end processors with a reduced or limited timing predictability. I hope this talk about finding worst case execution time information on modern processors was helpful and interesting um, for you. Please be invited to follow our AIT and Time Beaver product demos here by clicking on the corresponding banner. Of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to write an email to info.absynth.com or uh, access our website. Thank you again, take care and bye-bye.